Our God and Father, we give you thanks for this beautiful day you have made. We give you thanks for the sweet time of rest and a fellowship we have enjoyed. We give you thanks, our God, for the time of worship, of hearing your word and singing your praise and calling out to you in prayer. We give you thanks for this time of study and of discussion and of growing and learning and knowing how you have loved us. We thank you, our God, that you are our God, that you have not left us to ourselves, but you have drawn near to us, that you have spoken tenderly to us and won us with kindness and compassion, and that we are bonds of, bond servants in love. And we pray that tonight you would be merciful to us, that you would grant to us a spirit of wisdom and discernment, that we might grow in our knowledge of you and how you love that we might grow in our obligations to one another in our service to Christ. We pray that you would equip and strengthen us for the ministry that lies ahead this week, that we might bring great glory to our King. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. All right, so tonight we're on, I believe it's lecture five, which is going to be... Um, sort of the end of these introductory lectures, and then we're going to move sort of into the heart of the material um, two weeks from now. And this one is going to be Love's Ambition. In terms of these introductory uh, topics and, and talks that have sort of set the stage, or tried to anyway, for conversation about relationships between us, uh, we've looked at that, that grand scope of what kind of relationships are humans in, what kind of relationships do we as humans have with one another, and then we've looked at how those relationships are all sort of having at their core this operational commitment of love. And then we've looked at sort of different facets of love, defining love, describing love. Um, and now I want to talk uh, this evening, just to wrap it up, with sort of what are love's ambitions? To begin with, um, to sort of illustrate this concept of love being ambitious, um, I want you to think a little bit about uh, Ruth, the book of Ruth, the, the woman Ruth, who's a Moabitess. She comes back with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she's been gleaning in the field of Boaz, and uh, Boaz has already sort of tipped his hand uh, a lot. If you're a careful reader and, and you understand the context of the Old Testament, uh, Boaz has already spoken to her face to face. And that's kind of something that's, you know, a little special already, given that she's this Moabitess who's gleaning in his field. Boaz, likewise, has already been giving her extra portions and commanding his men to let her harvest among the standing sheaves, which was not a provision in the law. So he's already bending the rules to make sure she has a surplus of food to take home. Um, he's letting her eat from his lunch pail at the lunch break. Um, he's, he's already, you know, kind of been signaling how he feels about this young lady. Nevertheless, on that night that Naomi speaks to Ruth and says, I want to seek some safety for you, Ruth takes a huge risk. She goes out to the threshing floor where all the men are gathered and sleeping because it's a long day of work. And they've had a bit of drink and they've lied down and they're satisfied and Ruth goes over and uncovers his feet. Commentaries go crazy about explaining what exactly this means. How many of you have had the blanket stolen from you? <laughs> That's about what it amounts to. She uncovers his feet. His feet get cold. He wakes up and it even says in the text, in the middle of the night he rolled over and went, whoa, what's going on? And he looks down and behold, there's a woman at his feet. Why did he look down at his feet? Because they're cold <laughs> and his blanket's missing. So it's just a strategic way to get him to wake up. And so he looks down at her and she says, cover your servant. The hypothetical, or the situational thing is, I have uncovered your feet. Do one better. Give up the rest of your blanket for me. Make me your wife. Bring me into the protection of your house. This is what she's doing. She's proposing. She's proposing marriage. This is a bold thing. This is a risky thing. 
This is something that can end poorly in numerous ways. But notice the nature that love acts, that love takes risks. And notice how Boaz reciprocates. One of my favorite lines from the story is Ruth goes home that next morning early in the dawn before anybody could recognize each other. She sits for breakfast with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And I don't know if it's over the cup of coffee, the first or the second or the third, but the story starts to come out of how this went down. And Naomi says to her, sit still, my daughter. The man will not rest until the matter is settled. What a contrast that over the night, Ruth took this great risk and she went out on this limb. And now Naomi says, sit still. Because this man is not going to stop until he has solved it. Love is ambitious. Love acts. It stirs and it moves. But tonight I want us to think a little bit about how love acts. The four different acts of love, at least is how I'm going to frame it. First, love expresses itself. Expresses. Not espresso, that's yummy, but it's expression. It's love dares to transgress the space between us to reveal desire for diminished distance. Love dares to say, I want to know you and I want to be part of your life and I want you to be part of my life. It dares to violate those relative degrees of privacy. Love also protects privacy. But love dares to violate relative degrees of privacy, to invade one's life to an element in a degree not otherwise comfortable without love. Love says, let me move into your space. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, Paul gives us a competitive verb that we should outdo one another in honor and love. That there ought to be a kind of godly competition I know this is appealing to some of you, within the church, that we are competing with one another to outdo one another in acts of love and service and wanting to prove this effort of honoring each other. I remember when my brother was wrestling and uh, I would tag along and I became a wrestler and I became famous for being my little brother, for being my older brother's little brother. He became famous for being successful. At wrestling and uh, while I was tagging along in his shadow and enjoying a degree of fear from my opponents who thought I was as good as my big brother um, there was a famous basketball player in our school who would pick on wrestlers so one day he happened by the mat and he gave it a try with my brother after about a minute and a half he said I'd rather play a double header in the same afternoon than finish this match it was a full effort. It was an exhausting effort. Love is competitive. Love desires to be known. It has this energy to it that it wants to go out and to be known. There's a pulse to love. David Brooks puts it this way, in love there is an urge to merge. Synchronicity is the essence of all great professions of love. That when we love, we long to align our schedules. We long to align our lives. Let's have the same hopes, the same ambitions, the same dreams, the same efforts. There is a desire to merge together our lives. In this way, love's ambition for expression brings the ethical requirement to show intention. Love dares to see someone else, to actually see them, to not pass them by as part of the canvas of the world, to not see the person lost into the scenery of life, but to see the person as a person. This is an important point that I, I think growing up, I would have heard my pastor pass it by. But we live in the age of objectification, and whether that's a sexual statement or not, the reality is our culture tends to objectify and not see other people as people and not honor and respect the dignity of the individual. 
But love does not do this. Love has an intention. Love says there is someone there of worth and of value, and I cherish that person, and I delight to see that person, and to see that person thrive and happy and doing well. There's an otherness to the object of love that we respect and that we cherish. Likewise, love's intention listens. In addition to seeing who is there, we also hear that person. And we long to hear feelings come out. We long to hear thoughts come out. We actually say to one another, what do you think about that? How do you feel about that? Because love intends to know the other. I respect this other. I cherish this other. But I also want to know this one. And I want to learn from this one. That's the third one. We, in, within intention, we see people, we hear people, but we also learn from people. We long to be impacted by the objects of our love. We want them to shape us and to contribute to us, even as we contribute to them. There's an intentionality, a focus and a drive to have the lives merge and mingle. Let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, the three verbs that I use there, to see, to listen, and to learn, I've stolen from my previous sermons in the Gospel of Luke. Hopefully, at least somebody in the room has heard me use those verbs in a sermon in the last couple of weeks. That Jesus sees people. That Jesus hears people. Think just most recently of the ten lepers. It records specifically that Jesus looked and saw them. It records specifically that Jesus heard them. It says that Jesus asked them, what do you want? He actually invests and shows intention. Who are you and what do you want from me? This is love that drives us out of our space and into another's space. Think of Abraham. The strangers go walking by his, uh, his tent and what does Abraham do? You have to think closely and read closely in the text. It says he chases them. He runs them down. Now, I can actually connect this to this congregation because I've seen some of you run down strangers on Antrim Street who have left our church building without saying goodbye. So there is an intentionality to love. I want to know who you are. Don't flee from me. I will run after you because I love you and I want to know you. The servants in Jesus' parable who are sent out to collect attenders to the feast, the verb in Luke's gospel is that the servants compel the people to come. Love has a compulsion. Love has a force and an energy that says, let our lives come together. Notice also the prodigal son's father. He stands on the hilltop to increase his range of view. And he waits and he watches. He is longing for the missing son. He is looking for the missing son. And when the son comes into view, he, like Abraham, runs. Love is full of intention. Love longs to express itself. Love longs to have its expression received. Now, I will note just as, a, as an aside, just to cover it, so I, you know, if you wanted to ask about it, I'm preempting that question. Yes, there are penalties for unnecessary roughness in this category. There's the father-in-law in Judges chapter 19, who says, hey, stay the day. Hey, stay the night. Hey, stay the next day. Hey, stay the night. And ends up like setting in motion a really bad series of events that I'll let you look into at your leisure. Likewise, there is the prophet in 1 Kings 13, who the prophet of Judah has come up to Israel. He's prophesied against the golden calf in Dan and Bethel. And as he's on his way home, this other prophet comes out and says, hey, come eat with me. He goes, no, no, I can't. The Lord told me not to eat or drink here in Israel. And he's like, oh, don't worry, I'm a prophet. The Lord told me you should. There's a great line in 1 Kings 13, but he lied. Yes, <laughs> yes, he lied. These are two examples of where intention goes wrong, where it's no longer love. 
But setting those aside as sort of the, the, anti, you know, the uh, exception that proves the rule as it were, love intends, love makes effort, love displays energy. But likewise, love is not satisfied with soliloquy. Love is not satisfied with monologue. It longs for reciprocity. But that's my transition to the second point. Any thoughts about expression or intention of love? That one of love's ambition is to actually express itself. Love does not hide. Yes, Tom. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, there's, there's really two examples. One is you love someone, but you fear rejection. The other one is you love someone, but you recognize that that love easily goes awry in the situation or is misplaced or something like that. I think within this framework, using sort of the grand, you know, perfection understanding of love, you know, that, that yet yeah, true love in that sense would overcome the fear, perhaps eventually, that true love would win out and there would be a season of wrestling but love eventually says, no, I must be heard and expressed. Um, a really bad example is Mr. Darcy proposing to Elizabeth Bennett the first time. Um, love wins out, but boy, don't do it that way. Um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, secondly, with, with love discerning, sometimes love discerns which expressions are right at which time. And sometimes love ought to be silent, and love knows that. Yes. So um, I guess I struggle with this, and I've done this before, but it seems like these frequently apply to marriage loves or like intimate loves. Um, but this isn't supposed to. This is supposed to apply to all humans. So how would that be different? Um, so the three examples I gave, none of them were marriage. They were Abraham hospitality to strangers, servants bringing guests to the feast, and the prodigal father chasing his son. Well, that was an illustration I came up with, but <laughs> um, I don't know what you guys thought of. Um, I, I think it's it may be instinctive that our brains funnel into the romantic category, but I don't mean for it to be that way. I do think that love on each of its spheres and in each of its realms uh, has this ambition to express itself, to make itself known in some form of service, some act of, of ministry to others. So whether it's a pastor loving, whether it's a parent loving, whether it's a child loving, it, there's a longing to be expressed. I mean, so illustration for like a child, do not ch children come running up to their parents and throw their arms around their neck in sometimes the most awkward situations when you're like trying to have a meaningful conversation with another adult and just, I love you, mommy. It, the love compels expression. Um, I think there are also degrees, something important to remember um, that I had made a mental note when I was preparing is to point out that throughout of these ambitions, love will have degrees um, and each relationship will depend. So we may take illustrations that are in the extreme of this is love that is expressing itself in full-throated ways. And yet it's also appropriate for a different kind of love, a, a love of friends to be expressed in other ways. So my father knew his father loved him when they shook hands and made eye contact. My father decided his sons needed more than that. But it was part of the culture to say, this was something meaningful to my father and I'll recognize it as a very loud expression of love, even though today, you know, dads and sons hug.
pursue people in a way that is attractive to people to see, oh, this person is concerned for me as a person. Mm-hmm. And it, it, there's another way that that, you know, that that's certainly not romantic. Yeah, I remember uh, Kenji Smith talking about when he was pastor at Covenant Fellowship, you know, a few years ago. Uh, was saying he would go and uh, he would meet with people and he would say, um, I'm a pastor. I would like to meet with you and tell you about how you're a sinner and need Jesus Christ. Can we set up a lunch date or something? And I was just like, you did what? (laughs) These were visitors to church, strangers on the street. Um, But he had that sensibility. He, He also had the personality that when he said that to you, you were like, yes, I want to listen to you because I think you love me. Um, yeah, there's an atmosphere to it that is uh, expressed in community. Yes? I think that part of it could be, you know, with our individualism, that in this ambition of love and expression of love, when it comes to, you know, think of the example of that intimate Darcy, you know, that mm-hmm. thing, versus kind of substituting attention seeking for intention, mm-hmm. intentional love with our other relationships. There's a lot of individualism and attention seeking that prevents us from having, I mean, we need to have attention to show intention, but it's not sufficient to just seek other attention. Yeah, that we actually want to communicate to that person real concern and care. I see you and I am listening to you, you know, speak to me. Yeah. Make eye contact, make physical contact. Good questions, good, good thoughts. Yes? Another way to say this, um, love doesn't hide itself away. Yeah. If you love someone, we don't just keep that to ourselves. It's, it kind of has to be expressed in some way so that the object of our love. Right, there, and there is, yes, love has as its ambition an expression. Love wants to communicate its feeling of warmth and desire and self-sacrifice. So yeah, love doesn't hide. Love wants to reveal. Now again, without the full, you know, within the full range of human relationships, that's gonna look differently in each relationship. How you communicate that love is gonna be different. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. I think he's disarming. Yes. I think that's a, that's a gift that some people have. I know all of us probably have to some degree, but it's, I think it's, it's the person whom you're pursuing needs to feel like that they're not being taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I knew another retired minister in Beaver Falls who never had sh- brief conversations because he would walk up and he'd shake somebody's hand, look them in the eye and say, how are you doing? And then out would come like this life story. And it's like, how did he do that? <laughs> and it was that disarming sensibility of this person wants to listen to me. Okay, so because love expresses itself, shows its intention to care for one another, to be kind to one another, love also yearns then for reciprocity. Love has as its ambition persuasion. 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 I think that's right. Um, Love yearns to diminish the distance, but only by voluntary reciprocity. Love is not coercive. It is not abusive. It is not rude or self-seeking in Paul's language. To use Jesus' own phrase, whosoever desires to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. Notice that Jesus sets it as a condition. Whosoever desires to come after me. It is Jesus' love for the lost that he wants them compelled by, that there is an appetite within the lost to follow him, to seek him and to find him. 
Paul says, likewise, do you not know that it is God's kindness that is meant to bring us to repentance? Both God and Jesus Christ are said specifically in the scriptures to want love to win on its own terms. They want love to win by their own strength, not by manipulation or by cunning, not by power or coercion. But love has as its ambition the goal of winning the other by love itself. And so in this way, David Brooks notes that all acts of courtship are basically sympathy displays. That when we wish to win someone else, we display affection. We display attention. In this way, then, these are the two ethical standards. First, attention. Already mentioned by Patrick that love intends, but love also attends. Love focuses, gazes, stares upon the other. Love studies and contemplates. If you want a romantic example, go to the Song of Solomon. The illustrations are kind of weird, but you can't deny these two spend an awful lot of time thinking about each other. I mean, these are not metaphors that come freely as you're just sitting there thinking for 30 seconds. This thing took effort and work to write. But likewise, in all of our relationships, there is a focus, an effort, a studied intention that is displayed in attention. I know who you are, and I'm going to figure them out. Let me track three particular ways in which attention finds expression. First, birthdays, milestones, life experiences. At a minimum kind of level, love makes itself aware of someone else's life experiences. There is some awareness. You have a birthday. I kind of know where it is. I kind of don't know where it is. Love has some sort of desire to know what's going on in your life and what is the rhythm of the year? What are you experiencing? Love has an awareness and attention to what is the job you have? What is the marriage you are in? There's um, some kind of dynamic alive in the life of the person that says, I'm aware of your life experiences. I don't remember who I was talking to. Someone made the observation not too long ago to me. It's remarkable how often in this congregation I get asked about a prayer request that came up a few weeks ago. That's love's attention. I have heard the prayer request and then I ask again later. And I'm not saying I as in me, but I'm saying I as in we. That there is love at work in our hearts to actually hear each other's concerns and to actually follow up and to say, I am aware and attentive to what's happening in your life. Now, to go a little more intensely, the second tract is thoughts and feelings. That attention begins to focus and study on the inner workings of the person you love. You begin to track the rise and the falls of one's griefs and joys. Begin to figure out what is happening in influencing a person from time to time. And the person is not always fully aware of it. Let me give you an example from, from something uh, that, that we've, I've learned from sort of the, the grief counseling sort of standard. You may have heard often that when someone loses a loved one, you should always be aware of sort of the calendar of grief. Grief is not always equal, is it? But the attentive, loving person is aware that, you know what, at a certain time of year, certain feelings are particularly strong, often like holidays, right? And always on the anniversary of the passing. There's an awareness, an attentionality that says, I'm going to think about your feelings and your thoughts, and I'm going to track the influences on you that you might not even know of. Other examples would be figuring out the best time to talk, realizing that we don't all communicate the same at the same level. I'm a morning person. The vast majority of my mental and emotional energy happens between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m., and there's just a steep fall from there. 
<laughs> but as you can tell, you know, from let's say Sabbath routine, that creates a bit of a problem for a pastor, doesn't it? You all show up just as I'm beginning my slide. <laughs> But love says, I make myself aware of these weaknesses and I know when to ask questions and I know when to pass it by. There's an awareness that if you're married to a morning person, don't ask hard questions at 11 o'clock p.m. There's an awareness that there are times to talk. We also see the rhythms in the daily and weekly life. Do we recognize the best times to text to our friends and say, hey, how you doing? I'm praying for you. Have we thought about sort of what's coming on this week? Have we been aware, attentive and aware of what's impacting others? Jeff Schellenberger is where this afternoon? MGH. Are we aware? Is there an attention that says, I know what's happening in the lives of those I love. And then thirdly, and most deeply, beginning to track systems and even the subconscious. This goes far beyond a list of likes and dislikes. This goes far beyond reading the schedule. But love at its deepest and most intense level, its most demanding level, says I begin to attempt to understand why. Why do your thoughts proceed in this manner? Why do your feelings come out in this way? That I begin to, to read and to interpret the influences on a person. Love has this level of focus, of study, and of discipline that says, I want to show attention to learn who you are, how to care for you, how to sort out what's going on in your life. But this kind of attention is insufficient. If we do not also have affection, it's insufficient for two reasons. One, if you show this kind of attention to someone you don't truly love, it's creepy. Don't do that. But there must be affection, a true self-sacrificial desire to be impactful in the lives of others, to be significant. Not significant in the sense that we are great or glorious, but significant in the sense that love's ambition is to change others by care and by kindness, to win the reciprocity of love, to win the smile, to win it with kindness. Mark Robinson point, puts it this way when it comes to the church. Our capacity to enjoy the communion of saints improves as we are formed in habits of faithful service to one another. In other words, the way we actually come to enjoy each other is not by changing the other person into something special, but by serving the other person. The more we invest in our care of others, the more we come to enjoy the ones we care the pleasure and delight of Psalm 16 that is found only in the godly ones on earth comes from the disciplined effort of serving one another. In this way, if I can riff on a little theme that's been going on in our congregation re recently, the happiest people in our church are Kyle and Jake because they as deacons get to serve the rest of us out of this service. <laughs> Good. <laughs> out of service comes the joy and the delight. The fellowship of the saints brings forth laughter, brings forth peace because of the mutual service we give one to another. Let me give you one final illustration of this dynamic of attention and affection. And I warn you, it ought to be very arresting. It's from Hosea chapter 2. I'm just going to read these verses. Therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time, my new wine in its season, and will take back my wool and my linen given to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. 
I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees of which she has said, these are my wages that my lovers have given me. So I will make them a forest and the beasts of the field shall eat them. I will punish her for the days of the Baals to which she burned incense. She decked herself with earrings and jewelry and went after other lovers. But me, she forgot, said the Lord. The church had no attention to God, no affection for God. Love was gone. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will allure her and I will bring her into the wilderness and I will speak comfort to her and I will give her her vineyards from there. And the valley of Achor shall be as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and you will no longer call me my master. For I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals and they shall be remembered by their name no more. In that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the fields, with the birds of the air, with the creeping things in the ground, bow and sword of battle. I will shatter from the earth. I will make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. And I will betroth you to me in loving kindness, righteousness, justice, and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. How does God deal with his unfaithful bride? I will allure her. I will show her attention, and I will show her affection, and I will bring her to myself with love. Love wants to win on its own terms. Any thoughts or questions about that ambition of love? Yes, Chris. Carol. As you were speaking, I understood what you were saying about attention, and that I could sort of get an affection, but I still couldn't see what persuasion had anything to do with those until the very end when you sort of brought it. Yes, love seeks a response, but, but also what I want to emphasize about the idea of persuasion is that it seeks a response through its kindness, through its compassion. L love, in effect, has as its ambition, if I cannot win with love, I don't want to win. If I cannot get a positive response from this person, if I cannot build a friendship with this person, if I cannot build a brotherhood with this person, if I cannot build a romance with this person, with love, then I don't want to build those things. I, I don't want to go and depend on something else. Similar to that, you mentioned that when loving someone, you seek to change them. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more on that? Because I have a better question, because I didn't quite understand it. OK, so the idea of affection, um, part of that was drawing out the root to, to have affection for someone is to affect them or to be affected by them. So love has as its desire a mutual impact that you change me, I change you. And in this you know, dance of exchange of ideas and feelings and goals and ambitions, um, we end up drawing together and becoming shared. You know, the, uh, we end up being united in our ambitions as love compels us to change others, accept change in others, etc. The framework for change, of course, is going to be the law of God, the standards of God. So it seems that sometimes you can you know, love someone really hard and there's no change there. Right. Is that not actually love? Is that love foiled? Is that fruitless love? What do we call that? Yeah. Um, what was it? Uh, 
Coldplay, when you love someone and it goes to waste. Um, so uh, it is real love. It is not sovereign love. It is the difference between the love of God and the love of a creature. Our love aims for transformation and unification of persons. God's love achieves it. It's, it's a reflection of a sinful world, a fallen world, and an insufficient love, such as we express and have. Whereas God, by contrast, has a sovereign love. When he loves, he changes. Not he changes. He changes those he loves. Yeah. First time, then. So I was wondering, too, what you meant when you said love would be loving this to change this object. And what I eventually thought you were saying was that the change is, is the, the desire for the reciprocation of the, the, the change is you move closer because I've, I've expressed this you know, love towards you. Is that what you meant, or did you mean something aside from that? No, no, that's what I mean, is that unification. Now, within the framework of sin and so on, that unification will have to come by repentance and forgiveness and, and yeah, uh, a process. Those are the specific changes that are imagined. But, yeah, ultimately the, the change is a drawing together. I show you love, you show me love, I draw close to you, you draw close to me. But not change in the sense of, you know, swimming on the capital, it's just not <laughs> Right. Not that that ever happens in marriage. <laughs> <laughs> or friendships. Or <laughs> yes. Okay. You were talking about earlier about conversations and talking about like that. I think that points out that um, love can involve a large measure of self restraint. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, that's a, but, but I think that, 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 that's desiring the best for a person. Right. Yeah, love, again, because love is focused on diminishing the distance, love will acknowledge that sometimes, in, in Tom's illustration of annoying habits, we cover over and we move on and we learn. And, and this, is, this is something important, I think, with our friendships and our relationships. Don't just learn to sort of turn to blind eye for a time. Learn to be okay. If you are not going to f confront that issue, then you have to develop an attitude that says, I'm okay with that. Because eventually it'll come back and it'll boil over. But you're absolutely correct that love also chooses to say, I'm okay with that. And I'm just going to live with it. Okay. Then thirdly, which is C for this particular outline, love desires as an ambition presence. It desires to be in close proximity, but love also contents itself with that proximity. There's the great line from A.A. A. Milne, Pooh, said Piglet. Yes, Piglet, said Pooh. Oh, nothing, said Piglet. I just wanted to be sure of you. Love delights in proximity. Love delights in presence. And sometimes we just want to be sure of each other. Are you still there? Are you still listening? Do you still care? And there's just a desire for touch, for contact, perhaps metaphorical as well as literal. This expression comes out in Psalm 27 and Psalm 73. All I want, says David, is to be in God's house. Although if you read those two Psalms closely, you'll notice he actually says, or really, really close to it. If I can't be in the house of God, I'll be okay being a doorkeeper. I'm all right being on the threshold of God's house. I, I, I want proximity, a desire to be in the presence and a contentment with it. One of my favorite stories from Jesus' earthly ministry is the time that he's walking along and he's approached by a Syrophoenician woman. 
A woman who I just look at and go, I hope one day my faith is like hers. Because Jesus looks at her and she says, will you heal? And he says, no, 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 it's not right to give bread for the children to the dogs. And she says, even dogs get crumbs from the table. He's like, woman, go in peace. There is faith in this. There is love in this. The crumbs from the table of Christ are enough. I'm pleased and content to be in the house of God. There is a satisfaction that comes from knowing God, even in this small way. This satisfaction then trickles down, and it does not find full expression in our love for one another, because we're not God's. And so there is a need for more than crumbs from one another. There is a need for an open table, for a sharing of the full meal, for a bringing in of the other that says crumbs from the table of God will do, but for one another there must be a full seat at the table, a reciprocal rhythm of intention, attention, and affection. That as you display kindness to me and I to you, there there comes to be built within the relationship a mutual satisfaction. To put it in as precise a terms, I suppose, your relationship will achieve its satisfaction completely in the degree to which you serve the other and not yourself. And this is the radical economy of God turned upside down. This is the radical challenge that we have to present to our marriages, to our parenting, to our friendships, to our ministry, to others. The degree to which we pursue the well-being of others is the degree to which we will find that relationship satisfying. Does anyone know within the rhythm of life when people find marriage most satisfying? First couple of years and the last couple of years. Mostly the last couple of years. Do you know the years they find the worst? Least satisfying? <laughs> it's a little broader than that, but that's about the mark. Basically when you're parenting. When your coworkers and you're sweating and you're striving and you're laboring and that face-to-face dynamic is breaking down. By contrast... Do you know who humans on their deathbed generally credit with being their most satisfying relationship? Their children. There is this sense of satisfaction that I gave up so much. Even my joy in my spouse to raise these children. And yet it pays off. And yet there comes to fruition But this is true across the relationships. Have you ever seen what happens to soldiers when they come home from war? Have you ever seen what happens to those soldiers when you try to separate them? Soldiers from war long for other soldiers from war. There is a melding in the furnace of war between their hearts that you can only separate with breaking and bruising. They long for one another's company and they feel something is lacking. They long to go back to combat, not because they enjoy the sand and the dust and the sun, but because they have friends there that make sense to them and it's simple. There's a relationship there that brings satisfaction. And there is within all of this, I know, a twisting of our sense of satisfaction. And yet, we must acknowledge that love's ambition includes the desire to be satisfied with the relationship, a desire to achieve some sense of equilibrium and peace within the relationship, to have a proximity and a presence to the other that is mutually gratifying. Any thoughts or questions on that section? Yes. Together, it 
builds a bond that is more hardy and more rugged and tighter mm. than the times of peace could ever be. And I think that's can be an encouragement for us as Christians mm. as we face the spiritual warfare that oftentimes we don't see much benefit in it. But too often it's because we're walking alone. Mm-hmm. And that if we are walking with our brothers and sisters and bearing up that pain and discouragement <coughs> together, those bonds are being built that cannot be destroyed mm-hmm. and will be the better for it. Yeah, there's a, a great observation that one thing George Washington faced throughout the American Revolution was desertion. And he just had astronomically high, you know, as the American colonies. People just walked away. They just went home. The point in the war where they had the fewest desertions is Valley Forge. Why would Valley Forge be the one time that people stopped wandering home? Because they all sat around the campfire and said, you still here tomorrow? I'll still be here tomorrow. They weren't staying for freedom. They weren't staying for Washington. They were staying for the guy next to them. It built a bond of love. It built this bond of commitment and relationship that said we're suffering together. And it becomes important in our relationships to suffer together. This was this. So then the last one, permanence. Permanence. Love longs to endure. Love desires to prove itself in every test. Love desires to overcome every obstacle. In this way, there are sort of two facets I want to emphasize tonight. One is endurance, which is the traditional understanding of permanence. But in this way, what I want us to see, love does not merely endure by leaping every hurdle and succeeding. Love rather endures by falling and getting up. Love endures by confessing, I'm sorry. Love endures by saying, please forgive me. Love does not quit. Love apologizes. Love forgives. Love returns to the humble low point of saying we get through this through self-denial. We get through this through humility and acknowledging I need you and acknowledging I must put to death my hopes and ambitions. Love says the other will proceed and I will wait. Love endures by falling and trying again. Love endures by forgiving and apologizing. Love endures by embracing the principle I'm going to call reset. Love defies the long silence. Love defies the great distance. Remember at the beginning, love has intention. Love resets itself. When we love someone, we reset again and again and again. This is true of geographical distances. As somebody who's moved to the Northeast from the West, as somebody who before that was in Pennsylvania and before that grew up in New York and spent eight years in the shadow of an Air Force base, all of my best friends from all of my life, except for one, lives nowhere near me. You are all my new best friends. There's only one person in the room who remembers Oklahoma. Well, sorry, guys, you two. (laughs) You count, you count. Problem with making up an illustration on the spot. You don't think it all the way through. (laughs) But for the most part, all my childhood friends are somewhere else. And if you're anything like the rest of America, so are yours. Who knew you when you were a child? Who knew you when you were a teenager? Who knew you when you were becoming an adult? Where is the intersection of your life? And love says, even over the distance, I am willing to restart. I'm willing to call. I'm willing to text and email. 
I'm willing to break the silence and leap the distance and reset again and again and again. But likewise, love sees it in a closer and metaphorical way. I'm willing to reset every Sunday. I'm willing to reset every Monday to go back to work to those coworkers and to try again, to wake up the next morning with those kids and try again, to come back next Lord's Day and to preach a better sermon than this Lord's Day, to come back next Sabbath evening and have something else to say about relationships. Love says, I don't lay down and die. I try and try and try again. But love knows it can't keep up. Love knows it cannot keep the pace. And so love knows that at the end of the day, human love between humans, that we must fall on the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What shall we say to these things, says Paul? What shall we say to the reality that love yearns for this goal, aims for this goal, holds out these ambitions, but within us cannot achieve it? Instead, Paul turns us, what shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? For truly, the power to wake up tomorrow and love your coworkers, your children, your spouse, your pastor, your elders, your deacons, to love one another comes only from this fountain and grip that the love of Christ is inseparable. That Christ cannot lose us. Not in tribulation, not in distress, not in persecution, not in famine, not in nakedness, peril, or sword. No, not by death, not by life, not by angels or powers, not by things present or things to come. No, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. To spin off on Shakespeare, he said, love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. We might say as Christians, love is not love unless it has Christ. For love shall fail if it has not Christ. Psalm 62, we have a God of love. First John, we have a God who is Love. When we speak of our relationships, our human relationships are sustained by the presence and the pulse of divine love. And this is why Jeremiah, at his absolute worst, in the middle of one of the most depressing books that most of you probably read as fast as you can, Lamentations chapter 3, he says, His love is new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. This is love's ambition, to love like God, to love as God has loved us, to love with the love of God. And I'd better stop there. <laughs> Any questions or thoughts about that last section or, or the whole? Yes, Chris. Yes. Yeah, there's um, a reality to our human relationships. They are impermanent when they are not in Christ. And there's a sweetness to our relationships in Christ. Um, if I can steal my own thunder, <laughs> one of the points I'll be making later in the lecture, in, in later lecture, um, marriage is temporary. Keller calls it momentary. Parenting it's temporary. They grow up. They leave. They go on with life. Friendship. Brotherhood. Sisterhood. The bond of believer to believer is the one permanent part of our relationship. And it needs to be down at the core, ultimately, 
we're in these different systems and social orders of relationships, and that's right and that's good. But at its core, the heart of it needs to be a brother and a sister, a brother and a brother, a sister and a sister. There needs to be that friendship, peer to peer, eye to eye. We both love Jesus for all relationships. That's got to be the, the nugget at the bottom. Okay. So um, the plan from here is to go kind of through the Ten Commandments using each of the commandments as sort of a springboard into the different relationships that we have in life, you know, and, and sort of how the commandment provides uh, a foundation for the, different command, uh, for the different relationships that we have. So Fifth Commandment, we'll talk about parenting, um, as well as like mentorship, leadership, that, those kinds of things. Part of what I was thinking about as you were talking about purpose is, I mean, and this has to do with marriage, doesn't just have to do with marriage. Is that, um, one of the things that intrigued me as a single person was discovering that married people, whose marriages I thought were really healthy, would argue with each other and it was okay. <laughs> 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 no, it's, and I think, it, yeah, you're right that it's important for each of the relationship to say, I'm committed to this bond and my commitment is expressed in my willingness to face this problem with you. Yes, Carol. <laughs> yeah. How can I love more than one or two people in that way? You know, remember their anniversary. Oh, yeah. Birthday and be, spend time with them. So, and the people at a distance, you mentioned. How, is, it, is it sinful not to bump with somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Yes. What, what are the expectations here? Yeah. So, I, I think that uh, it, it goes back to sort of the idea of. Uh, I mentioned very briefly at the beginning the idea of degrees and that each relationship has a different degree. Um, if I can equivocate on the definition of that word for a moment, um, I, I've heard a lot of, of men who have come in you know, for counseling and whatever and, and said things like, I just don't understand women. And my practiced retort now is, that's okay, you just have to figure out one. You know, it's, th there's... Uh, sort of this idea of you need a master, a PhD of spouse, of children, of that family unit where it's like uh, really invest in that relationship first and have mastery of that relationship. Likewise, we see the same sort of uh, proximity sphere of, of influence and responsibility in Jesus' own earthly ministry. So uh, somewhere around the resurrection, he enjoys about 500 disciples of varying degrees. We're not totally sure. There's reference to the 120 somewhere in his earthly ministry. There's reference to the 72 as well. The exact dynamic that's going on there, I'm not sure. What we know better is the 12. Um, and it's interesting that in Mark's gospel, Jesus records, or Mark records specifically, Jesus chooses those 12. He adds the phrase, so that they would be with him. There is... in an intentional goal of intimacy that Jesus has for these 12 that he does not have for the other 120, the other 500. Um, and then likewise within the 12, of course, transfiguration is only eyewitnessed by three. And we often see those three traveling with him in some of these most profound moments, the Garden of Gethsemane. The, the 12 go in, well, 11, go into the garden but only the three go forward with him to the, to the time of prayer. So there's, um, 
I think within Jesus' own ministry, we see that understanding of there are different proximities to people that carry different responsibilities. I'd say where that segues with the point I'm making is though the degree we go with our intention and attention and affection will vary based on the proximity, based on the relationship, the fact that there is intentionality and attention should not. That, that there's some degree of awareness of who this person is. Um, in that way, at least kind of figure out who each other's names are. You know, start there <laughs> kind of idea, you know, and then build from there uh, the bond and the relationship. And there's also seasonal things, right? You invest a whole lot in the kids, and then you can invest a whole lot in somebody else. And same thing, you know, with, with my ministry, I can invest with, you know, one person or two people at a time, but maybe a few months down the road, those people can go off and do something else, and I can invest in someone else. <laughs> it's 10 after. Uh, you could ask me after we pray and sing, if that's okay. Was anyone dying to hear Jake's question? <laughs> so we'll close with Psalm 42. Again, David expressing his longing to be near to God, but also his hope that God will always be near to him. But before Psalm 42, selection D, uh, let me close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you did not stand afar off, but you have come near. We give you thanks that though you call out the stars in the heavens by name, you know each of us. And you carefully knit us together in our mother's womb. And you have numbered the hairs of our head. You are a God who knows us. You are a God who comes down to listen to us a God who walks among us. And we give you thanks that you are a God who loves in such a way. And we pray, Father, that you would forgive us for how feeble and frail our love is, how far short of your glory it falls. But we give you thanks that you have given us the hope that your love is renewed for us every day so that we day by day may not grow weary of doing good but that we might love once more and again and again in all our relationships of life as we desire to give you glory. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.